Jesus can have a seat. I got to dive in to this message. We are uh, finishing up this series that we kicked off uh, four weeks ago now. We kicked it off. It's called Throw Punch. And I've loved this series so much. It's been so much fun. But here's what I've learned. I've learned that we should not have just had one series with four different things. We probably should have had a series on each of the four things that we talked about over the course of the last month or so. And so as a result, that's exactly what we're going to do. Later on in the year, we're going to do a whole series on shame, a whole series on comparison, a whole series on anxiety, because the truth is, is that every person here deals with all the stuff that we've been talking about and diving into. Even even today, we're going to talk about something that every person in the room deals with at some level, uh, this thing that we call that we call insecurity. How many of you would say you deal with, you struggle with insecurity sometimes? Raise your hand. That's good. If you didn't raise your hand, you struggle with lying. Uh, but, but most people here do struggle with insecurity, at least at, at some level. And so uh, maybe some more than others, but the truth is we all struggle with it. And I don't know how you are. I don't know how it manifests for you, but uh, all the time in my own life, I think things, there, there's like there are conversations going, I don't know if I should say this, there are conversations going on in my head constantly. Do you, do you do this? There's conversations and they're happening and there's phrases and words and uh, different items that constantly pop into my mind and it's stuff like, you're not good enough, you don't know enough, you're not smart enough, you don't have what it takes, you're not that good of a dad. You're not that good of a husband. I don't know if you do this. Do you do this? Nod your head at me because if not, I just need to go. I need to go to counseling Uh, because (laughs) I feel like this is true all the time or I'll I'll do something that's really ridiculous and I'll have these thoughts that'll come to my mind like, you're not no pastor, at at least not a real pastor. I remember when I first moved here one time, um, when I first moved to Georgia and started the church, I was talking to this random guy and uh, this, we were talking, this was, I was talking, I've just got to tell you, y'all know uh, the homeless guy that rides his bicycle around town sometimes? I was talking to him, and uh, he didn't know me, and I didn't know him. Now he definitely knows me, and it's hilarious. But nonetheless, we were in the woods um, out at uh, Lake Ackworth, and this is exactly what he said. He said, hey, can you help me move this picnic table to this tree because there's a plug on the tree? And I'm like, there's a plug on the tree? This is amazing. And so I went, I helped him pick up the picnic table. I brought it over there. And um, his name is Adrian, by the way. And he was talking to me about stuff. And then he, the inevitable question, hey, man, what do you do? And I didn't know that he hated preachers. I didn't know that he hated pastors. I didn't know that he hated Christians. And I did not know that he hated people. And so um, he asked me what I did. And I told him. And immediately, like, the flip or the switch flipped. And uh, he goes, stop lying to me. And I was like, what? In God, what is wrong with you? He said, you're not a real pastor. This is what he said. You're not a real pastor. Look at you. I'm like, y'all, when a homeless person says that to you, it'll mess you up. And so that's a true story. I, I, I just remembered that. I didn't even tell that at the other worship experience. I just did. Just now, and um, nonetheless, those thoughts constantly come into my mind about just not, not being enough, not, not measuring up, not having what it takes. For you, maybe, maybe your relationships have been pretty jacked up, or maybe you made a big mistake in the past, and now you're super insecure about every relationship that you ever get into, or maybe you made some mistakes with money, and um, as a result, you're just super insecure when it comes to your finances, maybe you lost your job one time, and so you're always insecure about your job security and everything else. I mean, I don't know. There's so many. I was at a baseball game yesterday. I was there forever because we played in two games. And uh, while we were getting ready for the second game to start, this lady came up, and uh, she was talking to me about some stuff. that goes. She goes to our church, and she said, basically, the gist of the conversation was she, she feels pretty insecure about even her own relationship with God, like her own standing before God. And I thought about that because that's true uh, in, or at least it has been true in my life over the years. It's not as big of a struggle now as it used to be, but I constantly wondered, did Jesus really forgive me? Like, does God really have a plan for my life? I know he loves me because he is contractually obligated to do so, but does he like me actually? Because there's times in my life I don't even like myself. How could God like a person like me? These are all the thoughts that constantly flow through my mind. And as a result, I mean, there are just several things that 
That happened. You'll, you'll get on Instagram, those of you that have Instagram, and you'll get on there and you'll be scrolling through everybody's pictures. And you know those people, you have them. I know you do. You have those friends who they always post pictures of themselves um, with like less clothes on maybe than what is advisable uh, to take a picture in. And, and you think, you might think to yourself, I wish I had as much confidence as them. Um, you know, there's a difference between confidence and compensation. Sometimes you are overcompensating for a deficiency that you believe yourself to have. So you accentuate the one thing that you think you bring to the table, which is just another form of insecurity. And so it's, it's crazy because I don't find fault in all that. I just, I just know to label insecurity what it is. You see it all the time. Sometimes the overconfident person is overcompensating for something that they know they lack. They just don't want you to know. And so insecurity has a lot of different forms. And what I want to do is I want to talk about that a little bit. This is why I wish this would have been a series. I was so mad at myself in the last worship experience because I was saying to myself, self, you made a mistake by making this one message instead of making it three or four weeks. You made a mistake, but now you got to live with it because you can't just be like, well, we're going to do a do-over next week. You got to try to get as much information in to this message as you possibly can and still have it make sense. And so I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. I think the last one we did pretty well. I'm going to see if I can do it again, and then we'll do it again, and then we'll do it again. We got plenty of practice before this day is over. There was a guy in the Bible and he struggled with this as well. He struggled with insecurity all the time. Uh, this is a guy who had made some mistakes in his past. He had murdered a guy. Um, most of you haven't done that. There's probably a few maybe that have. Uh, you, you, <laughs> seriously. There are, um, he, he murdered a guy. And not only that, but he had a pretty violent temper, which is what led to the whole murder scenario. And in spite of that, God gives him like an amazing opportunity to be able to be a part of something that would set him apart really for the rest of his life. Matter of fact, the thing that God was setting him up for and giving the opportunity for is the reason that we're even talking about him thousands and thousands of years later. It's pretty amazing to see what it is that God did and what it is that God can do. But when God gives them the opportunity, you would think Moses would be like, sweet, man, this is like redemption. Now I can do this thing. I messed up, but now we're good. But that's not what Moses did. I don't know how you are sometimes when big opportunities come your way. But when this big opportunity came Moses' way, Moses panics. And he's like, no. I mean, he's having this conversation with God, a real deal conversation with God. And Moses says, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go and try to lead people out of slavery in Egypt. They've been there for 400 some odd years. I don't know if I'm the guy to help set these people free. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think I can do it. God, I don't think I can. And he has this conversation with them, and he, he says, if you read it in the book of Exodus, he, he starts saying, who am I to do something like that? Have you ever felt that way? I mean, I don't know if you feel this way. I know you do at some level, but all the time in my life, I think, who am I to do what I get to do? And who am I to be able to be a dad to three awesome kids? And who am I to be married to an awesome girl? Who, who am I to be able to do that? Because when I look around and I scan the world, so to speak, I see people that I perceive to be much more awesome than me. And I don't know if you're like this. I think this kind of goes back to the comparison trap, right? Like they're so or, uh, interconnected. But in this context, Moses is saying, I don't, I don't know if I have what it takes to do this. What am I going to say? Like, what do, what do I go and say to the most powerful man in the world at the time, his name was Pharaoh. That's who, that's who he would have to talk to. And he says, who am I to have a conversation with him? And then once I do have the conversation with him, what is it that I'm going to say in the first place? And then he says, what if they don't even believe me? And God's like, man, you got to chill out. And Moses says, yeah. He says, but God, have you forgotten that I stutter? Like you want me to go and be, you, you, you can't pick a stuttering spokesman. That's the, that's the worst spokesman ever. Like, let me be something else, but I'm not very good at talking in front of people. You want me to, you want me to go and have, you know, a speech in front of the most powerful man in the world, and I can't even get my words out of my mouth correctly? I can't, I can't do this. God, you made a mistake. You picked the wrong person. 
I, I mean, it's not in me. I don't know if this already resonates with you or not, or if I need to do some more legwork, but I'm just saying in every area of my life, the same thoughts that were flooding the mind of Moses are the same thoughts that flood my mind as well. And I wonder how many opportunities have we missed because we were afraid of the implications if we were to actually take a step of faith and do it. Like how many opportunities did you have that you squandered because whenever God says stand up, you chose to stay seated? It's interesting how this all plays out. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever know. But in this case, this is the scenario that Moses was in. And God goes at Moses, but he does it in like, he does it in this amazingly gentle way, while at the same time, he comes at him pretty hard. I don't know, only God can do kind of what it is that he did. But he says to Moses, he says, Moses, you got to understand that your, your lack of willingness to do this and your insecurity, it speaks more to your perception of God than it does your view of yourself. In other words, anytime you and I are insecure, it speaks more to how we perceive God than how we perceive ourselves. So it, it changes the game when it comes to insecurity because you thought insecurity was about you. Insecurity is actually about how you perceive God. Because if you perceive yourself to be less than, it means that you perceive God to have had made a mistake when he created you. And in my own life, I mean, I, I got to say, if that's true, there's been a lot of times where I thought God made some mistakes whenever he made me. I mean, for, for people that are in this room watching online, wherever it is that you're watching this from, I mean, people will say stuff like, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too skinny, I'm too fat, I'm too weak, I'm too strong, I'm too this, I'm too that, I'm, I'm too lazy, I'm too aggressive, you know, whatever the case may be, I'm so, I'm so driven or I'm so passive. All these different thoughts continuously come into our mind, in, into our mind and we think that we're less than the people that we see around us, and we think that other people are more well-equipped to do what it is that God has actually not even called them to do. God has actually called us to do it. And if we are unwilling to move on the opportunity that he has put in front of us, then we're going to squander the opportunity that he actually created us for. And so let me show you this. Uh, Exodus chapter 4, we'll dive in there. It says, the Lord said to him, so Moses says all that. I'm not the guy. I can't do it. I stutter. I don't have what it takes. I kind of suck, God. I'm not really that awesome. And God says to him, who gave man his mouth? In other words, you're talking about stuttering. I know, I know you stutter. I'm the one that gave you your mouth, bro. I, I'm the one. I'm the one. I created you. I created you. It wasn't a mistake created you the way I created you on purpose. I'm the one who did it. Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? He says, now watch this. Now go. Say go. go. He says, now go, and I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. You got to go. See, God does not give Moses the option. God was not like, oh, yeah, you're right, Moses. You stutter. Oh, dang it. I forgot. I got to pick somebody else. That's not what he did. He wasn't like, Moses, you are right. God, you are not good at being alive. Like you are just, you're terrible at being alive. As a result, you can kind of go back to where you were and I'm going to raise up somebody else. That's not what God does. God says, no, you're going you're gonna to go. You're going to do it. You're going to do what I called you to do because this is the reason that I created you in the first place. And what he was trying to help Moses to see is that God was seeing Moses different than the way that Moses was seeing Moses. I'm going to show you this. Here's the first thing. There's going to be three things that you're going to write down. These should have been three individual weeks, but again, you know, I'm a little bit overzealous in trying to get you some, uh, some stuff. And so let's see if we can do this thing in time. It says this, God's view of you is different than you think. God's view of you is different than you think. In other words, God does not see you the way that you see you. When you walk up to the mirror in the morning, have you ever walked up to the mirror and looked in the mirror and turned on the lights and you scared yourself? No. Some of you never done that. There's times you walk up to the mirror and you look in that mirror and you, you begin to see all your flaws. 
You begin to see everything that's wrong about you, everything that you're struggling with, all the different sins that you committed. And some of you, maybe you should have seen some of those things over the years because everybody else has been able to see them. But there are times when you see yourself and you project the image of how you see you onto how it is that God sees you. And you think that when God sees you, he starts listing all your flaws just like you do every time you stand in front of the mirror or every time you're driving down the road or every time you're getting ready to make a decision at the office or every time you walk into the, into the hallways of your school. If you consistently have negative self-talk going on in your mind, the danger is that you will begin to think that that's what God thinks about you as well. And that's not, that's not how God sees you. God sees you, or the way that God sees you, his view of you is different than you think. He knows what he put inside of you. He knows, he, for Moses, I mean, he knew. He knew that Moses was flawed. He knew that Moses had made mistakes. He knew that Moses wasn't necessarily the picture of perfection. But that's how God created Moses. And God knew that for this task, Moses was the perfect person for him to be able to use to set the people free. God knows his view of you is far different. You you just got to see this. I wish that I could go around the room. I can't. I just wish I could. I wish I could go around the room and just have a conversation with like every person individually and look you in the eyeballs and be like, God sees you different than you do. Right? Like, this is not my normal preaching style. Like, I like to yell and scream and run around and have fun. But I, I want you to know, some of you, you haven't heard this your whole life. Nobody, nobody told you that you have what it takes. Nobody, nobody told you that they loved you every day. Nobody told you that you're accepted. I, I try to tell my kids this every day. I say, I'll say to Bryce or to Lexi or to London, I'll say, Bryce, do you have what it takes? Yes. How come? How do you know? That's what I say. How do you know? Because you tell me every day. (laughs) Lexi, do I love you? Yes, dad. How do you know? Because you tell me 37 times a day. But listen to me, not every one of you grew up with that. Matter of fact, a lot of you grew up with the opposite of that. And as a result, you've been trying to prove yourself to God and everybody else for years. You have projected onto God what other people have projected onto you. And if you're not careful, you will project it onto your kids who come behind you. And so as a result, God's view of you is different than you think. And here's another thing that he wanted Moses to see, and this is true for us as well, is that God has given you more than you think. God has given, some of you need to write that down. Y'all just looking at it. You need to write, the way you write is you pull something out and you do this, or you can put it on your phone and you can use your thumb, or you can uh, grab your phone and take a picture of it right here. Ready? Like that way you'll actually remember it. If you, if you have it, you'll remember it. It's good. It's good. It's, it's the reason we put it up there so you can see it. God has given you more than you think. Here's the problem. There is a gap. There's this crazy gap that exists between who we are and who we want to be. And insecurity comes whenever we hyper-focus on the gap in between. Insecurity is, I'm this way right now, I want to be this way then, but I'm not yet, and as a result, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too loud, I'm too quiet, I'm too passive, I'm too aggressive, and you start hyper, I'm not talking about awareness, you need to be aware, but you hyper focus on what you're not instead of seeing what it is that you really are. Let me show you this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe it says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. That means my grace is enough for you. Like you don't got to prove yourself for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's important. My power is made perfect in weakness. I'll talk about that in a minute. Just remember that. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, the funny thing about this verse is literally this is the opposite of what we do. We spend all our time boasting about our strengths. We hide all our weaknesses. 
We don't want anybody to see our weaknesses. And it's the opposite of what Paul tells us to do in the context of this passage. He says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. In other words, weaknesses, they're all good. In insults, it's all good. In hardships, that's fine. In persecutions, if it has to happen. In difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Problem is, this sounds good. We just don't do it. And by we, I mean we, all of us, you, me, we, together, all of us collectively, we don't want people to know when we're weak. That's why people say, hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing good. Everything's great. How you dealing with that? I'm fine. I'm strong. I have what it takes. I can do this. But I'm not talking about I have what it takes because God said I did. I'm talking about I have what it takes. I don't need God's help. That's why people don't pray. When you live your life without prayer, you're telling God, I got this. But when hell breaks loose in your life, what's the first thing you do, even if you're not even a follower of Jesus? You start talking to God because you know you need him. But the problem is when things start going well, You start backing off, and when you start backing off, you're telling God, I'm I'm good. I don't need anything from you right now. I'll handle this on my own while I'm on the mountaintop. I'll talk to you when I get down in the valley. So we go around projecting that we're strong when God says it's our weakness that makes us strong. If we go around pretending to be strong, then what we are doing is we are actually becoming weak. Because God's power is not resting on you whenever you are telling everybody that you don't need it based on the way that you live. And then insecurity begins to rear its head because when you're trying to do life on your own, you are too tall, you are too short, you are too skinny, you are too fat, you are too lazy, you are too driven. When you're trying to do it in and of your own strength, you are all that. But Paul says, if we will do it the other way and admit, you know what? I got some shortcomings. I got some weaknesses. I got a gap. But you know what's cool about God? God will fill the gap for you. And he says to us, he says, I just need you to know I've given you and placed at your disposal far more than what you think. You need to know this. This is, again, this is the second thing I wish I could go around the room that I I wish I could just say to you, just me and you, like, In a room, just me and you for 20 seconds and me be able to look you in the eyes, put my hands on your shoulders, look you straight away in the face and say, you are accepted. You're accepted. In other words, you don't have to work for anybody's acceptance. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've already been accepted. I I could look you in the eyes and just help you to see this because not everybody knows. You are loved. Look to somebody next to you and say, you are loved. You know what's sad about that illustration? For some of you, that's the first time you've heard that in years. You are loved. You are accepted. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are worthy. You have what it takes. Look to somebody and say, you have what it takes. Just look at them. Even somebody you don't even know and just say, you have what it takes. Because I'm telling you, what happens is when you begin to speak that into the lives of people and you allow other people to speak it into your life, it'll change everything about you because most of you haven't heard it before. You have what it takes. You're significant. When we begin to second guess our ability, we are questioning God's craftsmanship. In other words, what we're saying is whenever we start thinking we're not enough, we start thinking God made a mistake. Uh God didn't make a mistake when he created you. You say, yeah, but my parents told me I was a mistake. There are accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. I I don't care if you were on purpose or if you were a surprise. It does not matter. You're not a mistake. Let's go to the third one. We don't got no more time. We got to keep going. It's less about you than you think. It's less about you than you think. That's what God was saying to Moses. Like, Moses, would you stop talking? Stop telling me what you don't have. 
Stop telling me all this stuff. You, you, Moses, shh. He's trying to tell him. He says, I need, you, I need you to know. I need you to know it's less about you than you think it is. You're funny, Moses. You thought it was about your ability to go in there and make a difference in, in the life of Pharaoh. That's hilarious. It doesn't even have anything to do with you, Moses. You're just, you're just, the, you're just the spokesman. I'm the one that's going to be doing the talking. I'm the one that's going to be doing my thing. I'm just going to use you to do it. It's less about you than you think that it is. And so Moses, he's like, all right, sweet. But isn't that how we are with God all the time, by the way? Okay, good, God. But I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you, I don't know, if you know what you're talking about. I hate saying that, but we do this. I don't know if you know who you're talking to because I, I, I fail all the time. I make mistakes. I do the wrong thing. But he says to him, he says, I I need you to know that it's not so much about you. And Moses says, yeah, but if I get there, who do I tell him sent me? Who do I I tell him sent me? If, If I show up, who do I tell him sent me when they say, who sent you? And God gives him this answer that makes no sense at the beginning. God looks at him and he says, whenever they ask you who sent, who sent you, look at him and say, I am. Moses is like, what does that mean? (laughs) I am. Yeah, I am sent me. That's who sent me. I am. What? God's like, here's the deal. When you need hope, Moses, I am. am. When you need power, I am. am. When you need joy, I I am. When you need forgiveness, I am. Whatever it is you need, whatever, whatever it is you need, that's what I am. You let them know. You let them know. You let them know right now whenever you show up that I am is the one that sent you. See, sometimes, you know what I think we got to learn how to do? I think we got to learn how. I think we got to learn how to talk back to the voices that are in our heads. I think we got to learn to talk back. I think we got to. Every time those voices begin to to get louder and louder and louder every single moment of every single day, it seems, we got to learn to talk back and we got to say to them, we got to say, you know what? I am not weak. I am not passive. I am confident. And you know why I'm confident? Because I know I am. I am loved because I know I am. I am forgiven. Why? Because I know I am. I am filled with joy because I am, because I know I am. I have what it takes because I know I am. I can do what God has called me to do because I know I am. Whatever it is God's put before me, God will do his thing in your life. The question is this, do you know I am? That's the question. Because a lot of us, We're trying to do our own life, our own ways, and we don't know I am as of yet. I am is the one who sent his only son, Jesus, down to this earth to live a perfect sinless life for those 33 years. The one who sent his son to be crucified on a cross so that you and I could live. The one who rose Jesus from the dead after he had been in the grave for three days. And God says to us, he says, I'm available To every single person that's in this room, I'm available to you. I'm available. I'm willing. I can do far more in a moment than religion could have ever done in a lifetime. One moment with I am can change everything in your life. That's what he says. That's what he wants you to know. The question is, though, the question is, do you know I am? Do you know him? Because for us. That's the most important thing. The most important thing that you can do today is not get past insecurity. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the most important thing you can do is say yes to I am. All over this room, if you would, bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to do two parts to this invitation. And the way I want to do it first is this. If you're in this room and you want to say yes to Jesus, you want to say yes to I am. If that's what you want to do, you're, you're ready to place your faith and your trust in the son of the living God right where you are. I'm going to pray a prayer with you. You can just pray it in your heart as I pray it out loud. Say, 
Say this in your own mind. Say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know you died on the cross for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin, to step into my life and to save me. Lord, do for me in a moment what I've been unable to do in a lifetime. God, I want to say yes to you the best way I know how. I turn from my sin and I'm turning to you, making you the Lord and the Savior of my life. If you just